Hello everyone, this is On Tyranny. It's the radio branch of Ancient Greece Revisited. Um, we have a YouTube channel you can visit. Uh, those of you who are already subscribed, thank you very much. We're doing short documentaries on ancient Greece, um, trying to rediscover, recapture the spirit, the ancient spirit of Greece in the hopes that it's going to shed some light to what's happening today. And many things are happening today. And since the outbreak um, and the measures taken, we have decided to start this little podcast and invite people who know much more than us and discuss whether or not we're seeing the rise of a global tyranny. Last episode, we had a great guest called the Athenian Stranger on the front of ancient political philosophy. And today we have an equally interesting professor, Peter Y. Paik who taught for 10 years in the University of Wisconsin and is now teaching in the Yonsei University of South Korea. He has thought a lot about the future, analyzing literature. Um, he focused on Kafka, on the uh, very dark and fertile imagination of Kafka. And he also focused on science fiction, uh, which immediately drew our attention uh, being uh, screenwriters and filmmakers here. And before, I'm also joined by the other half of Ancient Greece Revisited team, um, director Adamantios Petritsis. Hello, on my behalf. Uh, uh, director, editor, everything visual that you see on our uh, YouTube channel. It, it's his, everything verbal is mine so far. Hopefully, there's going to be some crossover. So, be, without further ado, Professor uh, Peter Paik, thank you very much for joining us here. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have a very, very interesting conversation considering your knowledge. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Michael and Adam, for inviting me. I'm really looking, really looking forward to talking with you both. Um, and I immediately understood when we had our preliminary discussion that you spent some time uh, abroad in in the states because your uh, your uh, English was uh, was perfect. So uh, that was um, the first thing I noticed. Uh, how 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 many years did you spend in the states? Oh, I um, actually I grew up in the United States. I um, yeah, you know, so I lived there for uh, I guess you'd say like uh, forty. 46 years. Okay. Yeah, um, so, um, but I moved to Korea, uh, you know, about uh, um, three years ago. Okay. Uh, how was that change? Because uh, myself, you know, I spent a considerable amount of time abroad and coming back is always like a bittersweet feeling. Um, you get all the nostalgia and you get all the, the, the comfort of being back home, but you feel a little bit like a foreigner. So I guess with you is what I experienced times 10 or 100. <laughs> How did you feel going to a place that it, it, it's yours and it's not, I guess, would that be fair? Yes, I, I guess I would say that it's not, uh, it doesn't quite feel mine. Um, I, I mean, I, I, you know, like I've lived most of my life in the United States and that's what I know best. Um, and, um, and, you know, but, but also Korea has changed a lot um, since, uh, uh, my family left in the early 1970s. So even when my parents, uh, you know, come to Seoul, they find the city completely unfamiliar. It's very different from uh, what it was um, back in um, back in the 1970s. Mm. And so I think for a lot of Koreans, it's it's been a very um, maybe a kind of a dizzying experience of of modernity, of a very very rapid change um, that has taken place within um, the span of uh, a few decades. You know, there's often a comparison made that the Koreans have gone through in, you know, forty to fifty years what, uh, um, you know, what Europeans and Americans have gone through in about two hundred. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can relate to that strangely enough because Greece mm -hmm. is not your average European city um, country, and yes. Athens, mm -hmm. where we live, is not your average European uh, city. And um, b because of historical circumstance, you know, we we came quite late into the modern world and we had this rapid development that always leaves its marks and we've been struggling I guess to reconcile a more traditional understanding of who we are with a very modern um, always feeling that the modern must take precedence um, so I guess 
uh, Korea went something similar because you were a very traditional uh, country as well, right? Uh, yes, although it had been colonized by um, Japan, um, so uh, you could say that the traditions have been uh, the Koreans have been twice removed from tradition. Um, mm. you know, and the Japanese also tried to bring their version of uh, modernity to um, Korea, um, and and um, so it's it, it, it's a kind of a, a very interesting question of what constitutes tradition in South Korean society. A lot of these things are up for debate. Um, I mean, in part because, for example, if you think about like how um, like you know royalism or uh, monarchical politics is still. Uh, you know, a kind of a phenomenon in Europe, right? In the sense that it may not be very popular, but it certainly designates a certain kind of coherent political orientation. Well, but, in in England, where I lived for ten years, it's it's a reality. Mm -hmm, yes, uh -huh. but in Korea, there um, it, it's been difficult to establish a kind of a positive political tradition, in part because um, it was through the weakness of um, of the monarchy that. Um, you know, that the Japanese were able to take over. Mm -hmm. So, so there's a kind of a real question of what of what traditions are um, usable, or what are um, what can be, in some sense, what offers a kind of a future here. P perhaps there was a, a feeling of betrayal. Even would would you say that's the case? Um, I I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think it led um, you know some uh, some people to. Um, you know, embrace uh, um, communism, although that was, you know, fairly common, I think, among um, uh, people in East Asian countries because they thought it was the fastest way to become modern. I mean, not necessarily because they were interested in, um, I mean, yeah, they were interested in equality, but it seemed that, it seems to me that they were also, they saw it as a means to become modern more quickly um, because, of course, the communists had declared that uh, they were the sort of the cutting edge of history, you know. Yes, so what, yes. Um, you know, so why bother with, uh, with uh, building up a work, uh, middle class, right, when you can just simply leap into the uh, most advanced form of, of modernity? Back to your, to your study, um, you, you did a PhD on revelation in modern literature. Just to unpack that, because the, the last thing I want is just to throw terms around uh, it, that are not clarified, okay, which is something that unfortunately I encounter a lot these days. What is modernity? What is the modern world? It's a society that tries to uh, overcome all the old hierarchies of uh, the pre-modern past, right? Um, aristocratic privilege, um, caste, um, your uh, tradition. Um, and it's an attempt to give uh, you know, individual men and women as much power as they can to uh, to define the terms of their existence, right? Everything becomes a choice. So if you want to live like a traditional person, um, you can, it's, a, it's up to you. If you want to live like a uh, modern person, um, you know, uh, without religion, without uh, some kind of identity based on tradition that's also uh, available as a choice. Um, everything becomes and, an option. Yes, uh -huh. yeah, nothing, everything is constructed, nothing is uh, natural. Nothing merits our unconditional obedience. Um, and, and, and once everything becomes an option, everything becomes relative and interchangeable. Yes, I think that's a conclusion that many, uh, that most people um, draw. Um, is it, although there is a certain element, um, you could say that there's, there's still an element of coercion at work in the sense that, um, you know, you have to view everything as an option, right? You're not free not to see things as uh, um, as, as a kind of destiny, right, or as the effect of some kind of of, um, of providence, even. Right. Um, yes, I think if you tell people today that there's, uh, in very general terms, even that there's a good way and a bad way to live, um, they kind of find the idea strange, foreign, and some might even take offense. Um, which in retrospect is very strange. I mean, probably I was there myself, but in retrospect, you know, it's a very, it should be a very rational idea that yes, there is a good way to live and a bad way to live. But today, like you said, I think um, we, are, we live in a culture that every t way of life 
must be considered as absolutely equivalent, absolutely interchangeable. You can be a, a, a Buddhist, uh, tech startup, CEO, capitalist, or, or nature-loving, new hippie, uh, out-of-the-grid, feminist, uh, lesbian. And the, the, there must never be a judgment as to whether one is better, whether one is superior. I think even the word of, of hierarchy is almost forbidden today. Would you agree? Uh, yes, although I don't think that this was always necessarily the case within modernity. Um, I think there is a, I think it is possible, and I think there was a kind of a moderate modernity, where instead of saying that there is no, uh, you know, um, good way to live, the idea was that there were um, multiple good ways to live. Right, mm -hmm. um, and so um, and, and so you had to find the way to live that was in accordance with your nature and with your interests. Right, and, and so within that, you could still talk about judgments of, of good and bad, right? Um, but I think we've gone. Uh, but modernity has taken a kind of uh, authoritarian turn, as uh, you know, as you point out, right? So that um, and so what what this does is that it makes people feel very lost. Right? I mean, if you want, you know, if you want to be a good musician or if you want to be a good, good artist, right? Obviously, you don't want to be a bad artist or a bad musician, but there don't seem to be the same kinds of guides for people to, um, so that they can learn, you know, how to, um, you know, follow, to, you know, take the path to, you know, to, to really achieving something, right? in, something meaningful. Uh, I wanted to ask you, in what time frame do you put uh, current modernity? I mean... The modernity that we grew up is different than the modernity now. I would, I would uh, suggest, I would uh, suspect. So uh, the modernity yes. that we're talking about now, when, which uh, time frame would you put it? Uh, as in after 2000 uh, or earlier? Wow, this yeah, uh, this is a very interesting question because I, I'm not quite sure. I think that maybe around 2010, 2012. Mm -hmm. um, is when uh, a, a lot of um, authoritarian aspects of um, you know, progressivism began to really uh, be, you know, be very, uh, um, you know, began to reveal themselves. Um, I, I think that, um, like certainly in the United States, I mean, you know, when uh, George W. Bush was president and the United States was involved um, in, the, um, you know, in the Iraq war, right, um, you know, there were lots of fears that... Uh, that liberalism was dead, <laughs> you know, that, that left-wing politics had no future. Um, and it's really startling how uh, swiftly that turned around. Yes, absolutely. It, just to say, how is the situation in, 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 in Korea? Because in that cultural debate, a lot of people in the West, whether Europe or the States, look at Asian countries as this bastion of tradition, you know, and perhaps they don't have a very fine eye, they don't necessarily distinguish between Japan, China, you know, but perhaps they lump things together too much. Yet, there's this idea that a country like Korea is still this bastion of tradition, um, almost like a promised land for traditionalists. What would you say to that? Well, I don't think that there are too many. Um, I would say that it's certainly not a, a promised land in, in, in that respect. Um, okay, so it's a uh, capitalist society that's been, you know, that's become very prosperous. Um, there's a lot of materialism in the culture. Um, but I think maybe what protects it is the fact that, um, that most people have to work very hard. And I think that also kind of constrains um, the range of thoughts that people can have, because ultimately it comes, you know, things have to come back to, uh, well, you know, I have to make a living or I, you know, or I have to, uh, you know, um, work hard so that I can have an apartment or um, get a better job. And I think it's this um, kind of the fact that that it, that it's not the culture itself doesn't have the same level of of um of affluence and i mean it doesn't like people don't have that kind of mentality as, as much as they do in in the u.s where you know people don't feel free that free feel free not to confront practical issues 
Um, and, and I think the, the sort of this practical element, you know, in some ways has kept people uh, moderate from embracing, you know, radical ideas. Although, I, although it's also, you know, it's, I mean, it's also kind of, uh, you know, interesting that, that, you know, that uh, you know, people like Judith Butler have made inroads um, among uh, younger people. And there is a kind of interest um, in, um, you know, there, like there has been like a Black Lives Matter uh, protest. Um, there there, there also, has been a Black Lives Matter protest in Korea. Yeah, in Seoul. Um, in Seoul. And there are... Like how, part, how is this taken? Like, I'm very curious. If, if you have a Black Lives Matter um, protest in Korea, do you have a... a, a percentage of uh, black Koreans no or, uh, no no it's uh it's it's not that I think in many ways it's um based it seems to me to be local uh, young progressive people for whom this is kind of like their um, you know they want to join the bandwagon right I mean you know there were BLM protests you know all across Europe right where there uh, even even in those countries where you know there's a, a tiny uh, with a, po a population of of um, you know, of blacks is tiny, mm. um, and so I think there is a kind of um, you know global uh, uh, kind of uh, you know sort of um, it's not exactly a movement, but generally you know people do look to the United States as a kind of a model to emulate. You know, so if you want to be uh, fashionable, you know, adopt the latest ideas, you really have to follow the United States, and um, you know, and, and so there is some of that in in, in Korean culture. Although a lot of it obviously is um, not really based on any kind of um, you know real knowledge of uh, of actual conditions within the United States. Yes, absolutely. And you know, from what you've said, it's very interesting. Just to tie two things that you you said there. You said that perhaps the latest version of modernity starts around two thousand and twelve, and also you just mentioned the. Um, Kore young Koreans adopting these very radical um, um, American or European ideologies. Um, there's a journalist, an Irish journalist, um, who half jokingly, you know, he was definitely on the conservative side. Uh, uh, John Waters is his name, whoever wants to look him up. But he was, um, he was saying half jokingly, I guess, that something happened around 2011 was his date where the whole world, he said, w phase locked. So it's almost like he was bordering on the metaphysical there, but he, he said it more poetically then. But there is something in that date. And for us in Greece, it was just when um, Greece signed uh, the memorandum, as we call it, a huge debt agreement, which is essentially gave away our national sovereignty and there were riots before but then 2011 when that passed in law and our destiny was kind of sealed or locked together with our national debt which by the way it's what i think it's still the biggest in the world but that's for another show um the, and something and they stopped they stopped it it's almost like this had a tranquilizing strangely enough this um you know effect and throughout the world, they, you say 2012, and he said 2011, and that date seems to be important. There was a transition where things went full global. And how? Why is that? Yeah, it's sort of hard to um, answer that question without uh, venturing into territory that you know that uh, you know would be called a conspiracy theory. <laughs> Or conspiracy mongering. Well, we're but, not shy of that, and I'm, I'm going to give perhaps uh, in another show my version. You know, um, it's it, conspiracy theory is obviously a word of slander. So if yes. you throw it to someone, you are essentially want to discredit him. Or people who take it upon themselves, it's m more like a tongue in cheek. It's like saying, "Yes, I am a conspiracy." So what? They don't really mean it. They don't want to be seen as that. Um, I don't want to be seen as that. Adam does not want to be seen as that at all. Um, but we're open to possibilities that in our current understanding might be considered conspiratorial while they are not. So please, if you just unpack that for us. Well, I, yes, I mean, I agree with what you've said about uh, how um, conspiracy theory is tossed around in the mainstream media as a term of abuse. 
but, um, but it's also possible to talk about conspiracy in the sense that there are a lot of decisions that are made that impact huge numbers of people you know, that are not accessible to um, you and me, right, as, as outsiders. You know, so we, are, we do not belong to the inner corridors of power. You know, we don't know what goes on, um, you, know, in, uh, you know, in the uh, highest offices of, of major banks. You know, we don't know, um, you know, you know, what uh, people who, what heads of state, you know, might really be thinking. Um, and so it's almost as though perhaps that a, there seems to have been some kind of crisis that has brought about the creation of a kind of second reality, mm. right? Uh, you know, alongside um, the reality that we, uh, you know, like an attempt to kind of change the reality that we live in. You know, and perhaps there are some uh, exigencies and constraints uh, that we are not fully uh, able to see that might be behind that. Um, you know, like um, you know, the United States is also incredibly heavily indebted, right? But the United States has not had to suffer the same kinds of penalties that Greece has had to suffer, right? Um, you know, like this whole um, you know debt uh, you, know, you know leveraged economies um, all across you know, the world is, as they, you know, like, how is that, you know, connected to the need to have some kind of global, you know, ideology? Um, it's very strange, especially given the fact that, that it's, it, it also seems to be a symptom of decline as well. You know, as manufacturing has moved increasingly to China, you know, we see the rise of China as a major power, you know, that has really, um, you know, become uh, more of a, you know, a much more conspicuous topic in uh, recent months. Um, but it also seems to be connected to um, some of the changes that are happening. Uh, I mean, like, how does that relate to the changes that have, uh, to, the, to the move towards full, full, uh, full on global, globalism that is taking place in the West? I mean, obviously, if we want to have a completely total globalization, we would need to include China, but it seems really just confined to the West and its yeah, satellites. That is a very good point. Yeah, the global, although globalization by itself means global, means world, means planetary, the ideology that comes with it is mostly adopted by Western countries. Yes. And to relate it again uh, to the to your um, to your thesis, um, your thesis was revelation in modern literature. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. What does that mean, revelation in modern literature? Oh, um, you're taking me back uh, actually quite uh, a long ways. Um, in, uh, I never um, uh, published my uh, dissertation. Um, it's something that I uh, wrote um, in, in large part because I wanted to um, confront something that was large, that I thought was. Uh, Confront ideas that were that I felt were um, important, but but largely uh, missing in um, the education that I received, you know, in the humanities. And so, by focusing on um, the category of revelation or revelatory experience or insight, uh, what I wanted to do was to um, you know, sort of make the case that that this kind of you know, in some ways that that are secular that 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 there are many um, limitations to seeing. Uh, literature, um, even modern literature, from a secular standpoint, that um, these categories of uh, revelation and uh, mystical knowledge are uh, very, um, you know, are, are are vital, you know, uh, you know, to understanding, um, you know, modernist literature. And what would you consider a revelation, an example of? Um, what I I drew very heavily from. Uh, Sort of Rene Girard's idea that um, that when we have a, a great novel, uh, what we find at the end is a kind of convergence between uh, the author and um, the main character. Hmm. Right. So in a in, so so in a great work of fiction, um, the character in in the in the, in the narrative develops the or gains the knowledge to be able to write the whole work. And wow, I think that this, 
And, and I think that this is a kind of a mystical process. You know, the author has to engage in, um, you know, because the, it, 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 it in some, it, my argument is that it actually uh, parallels the dilemma of the author in trying to write a work. You know, so how okay, does the so author then know how to write the work? That's very interesting. So the journey of the hero in the novel is a parallel of the journey that the writer needs to take to actually get to the ability to write the novel. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, to and tell the story. And actually the lack of good stories nowadays, in my opinion, maybe is a reason that this trip doesn't happen anymore. Uh, That's a yes. very good point as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. How, how would you elaborate that, Adam? I don't know. I just uh, thought about it now because of what you said. But uh, what I feel now, uh, I'm talking about mostly uh, screenplays, so for films and stuff. Uh, we don't see anymore uh, the good stories. It's like always a recycling of uh, what we already know and uh, on a very flat uh, surface, flat level. There's no deepening in the stories. There's no exciting stories anymore, I think. And what you said just now could be, uh, you know, the re uh, one of the reasons behind it, that uh, we just write without thinking, let's say, mm -hmm. without actually experience, experiencing the story ourselves. Without going on the journey. Of, of the hero. Yes, I yeah, that's a really great point. I, I think it's also because our, our lives are very uneventful. I mean, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if like uh, what um, it was Tolstoy, right, who said that uh, happy periods are, are the blank pages of history. If this True. may also be a problem uh, with our art, that we live in a in a world without events, you know, and so because we do not um, have this kind of experience of you know, that previous generations had, whether, you know, war or, or some kind of suffering, right, that our lives then become very difficult to narrate. You know, we don't have these um, turning points anymore. We could have this conversation again in five years, if you want, <laughs> and, right. and, see, and see what stories we'll have then, because now we kind of live in some kind of event. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, definitely. I think it will be very interesting um, to revisit uh, these ideas in, in five years. Maybe but sooner what, because, you know, life, um, you know, the pace of events, I think, has also picked up. It has. But what's interesting in, in relation to what you say is that we don't experience it as an adventure. I mean, th there was even an ad in Germany that um, was saying it was playing on this concept of the hero, you know, and it was trying, it was just showing someone on a couch saying, you can be a hero now by staying on your couch. Essentially, it's what it said, because you don't, it's about not doing anything, not going out, not breathing, not, you know, um, being in contact with people. Uh, so it's an anti-climax that is happening. Mm -hmm. it yes. Ju yes. And uh, so to give an example of this would be very interesting, because like I said, we did our homework um, with Kafka. Uh, who was a part of your dissertation and a part of your interest. And uh, one of his famous stories is called uh, The Metamorphosis, a very dark, surreal story where uh, the main character wakes up one day transformed into a cockroach. <laughs> and then he goes into this... It will never explain why. It does not matter. And he goes into this description of how it feels to be a cockroach. And... He's on its back and trying to, you know how when, when bugs get upside down, they, they have problems uh, turning over and he has the same problems, which is very cringy, of course. But And then it's this dark experience of being a cockroach in his room. He's living with his parents, which I guess is an experience, unfortunately, that a lot of our viewers might be sharing uh, because of various conditions. So he's living with his parents. His sister is on another room and they have a very close connection and she's playing the violin and he's there, this hideous cockroach creature inside of a family. Yes. What would be your take on this? Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a while since I've read it. I, um, 
I think that it's um, like for me it was a, uh, like my experience of it is, is that it's a very uh, some ways very horrifying story. Um, I mean because uh, and the horror I think comes from how um, Gregor changes in the eyes of his parents and sister. Right um, you now the sister who is at first uh, the one who tries to even after he's changed to, to try to take care of him and to maintain some kind of tie. Um, but then when there's the misunderstanding that happens, when they try to move furniture out of his room in order to give him more uh, space to uh, scurry around, um, that, um, that the sister turns, or, or you know, that, that the relations, relationship's really sour. And it's when um, Gregor comes out to hear the music um, that the sister plays and drives away the, the guests, right, that um, the sister turns against him, right? You know, so um, so, so, so underneath a, it is a very typical uh, modern family. <laughs> it's just that one member is a giant cockroach. Yes. What did you take, Adam? Uh, it could be a family. It could be also, well, I think the obvious, obvious, anyway, the more uh, clear take to this could be a society that they have the, the outcasts in the society that once used to be part of the society and at some point they change and they, they, they are taken aside and uh, nobody understands them anymore even though they understand the rest of the society. But okay, this could be one take of it, but... Uh, it's an interesting take. But coming back to what we said before, it's a simple story, you see, but it has the way it's written or is um, portrayed by Kafka it has a, a very, I don't know how to say it, uh, it has great value in it, it has a, it, it's deep, even though it's a simple story, it's deep in itself, it has a lot it of meaning. It has weight, yes. Mm -hmm. And you can uh, relate yourself with some of the characters, maybe. Uh, which, so coming back to what I said before, you don't have to have a great story as a, a story itself, but it's the way you write something, the way you portray something, mm -hmm. uh, which is what is uh, of real value. And this is what we don't have anymore, I think. Yeah, there's something really powerful about the ending. Um, I mean, it's not just the death of Gregor, but reading from um, uh, the English translation that I have here, Right, that it's when um, after Gregor has died, um, the parents and the sister, all of whom have recovered their health. Right, the parents had, hadn't been well; they've uh, they've recovered their health. The sister has a good job, um, and um, and it says that while they were thus conversing, it struck both Mr. and Mrs. Samsa almost at the same moment as they became aware of their daughter's increasing vivacity, that in spite of all the sorrow of recent times, which had made her cheeks pale. She had bloomed into a pretty girl with a good figure. They grew quieter and half unconsciously exchanged glances of complete agreement, having come to the conclusion that it would be soon time to find a good husband for her. And it was like a confirmation of their new dreams and excellent intentions that at the end of their journey, their daughter sprang to their feet first and stretched her young body. So the story ends with a, um, a young uh, woman right, rising to her feet and stretching her body. Right? It, it, it's a very strange ending, right? It's not, you know, the, you don't, we don't see words exchanged. There's um, no hint of mourning, uh, but but we have a kind of an image of a very attractive person, you know, stretching herself and, and about to, uh, presumably about to embark on on a on a full life. Right? I yes. think it's the Kaf yeah, it's it's this co contrast that Kafka evokes between the kind of abject horror of Gregor, who has been turned into this uh, insect, and then the um, kind of the, these notes of, of hopefulness and, and joy that we get at the work, right? That, that it makes it really difficult, I think, for us to try to process what the meaning of the story is. What, what, what is it that Kafka is trying to tell us by showing, uh, by, you know, by juxtaposing two such uh, drastically different, um, you know, moods? And uh, another take, now that you said this, which is contrary to what I was saying before, is once you manage to get over your problems, thinking that Gregor is the problem in this case, 
you can now see with new eyes what beauty you have in front of you and you couldn't possibly maybe think about it before, which is the daughter in with, this case. With one difference that the problem is you, in that the problem is the main character who, with whom you, you, as the reader, you tend to identify. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, once you are, you are the problem, once you are taken out of the equation, uh, life can flourish finally. <laughs> Yes, and, and I think there's also something, uh, uh, I think in Kafka stories, there's often a kind of a de-spiritualizing movement, right, in which um, people who are associated with some kind of, you know, spiritual preoccupation or, uh, or vocation, right, um, you know, like Gregor, for example, becomes, you know, more meditative, you know, as um, in, in his insect form, um, is then somehow disposed of. Right. That 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 um, what is I, I think really uh, you know, disturbingly powerful about Kafka's work is the way that he depicts the fate of the spirit. You know, so so what we regard as um, spiritual things are thrown away, and what we're left with is the health of the body, and that's all there is. You know, mm -hmm. it's a kind of an existence which is lacks any kind of connection to uh, higher aims and purposes. Yeah, and it's perhaps something that we're witnessing now because, and uh, w without getting into any of the details of what's going on, um, it's pretty clear that at least a decision has been made worldwide that health is um, the, the, the absolute focus at the cost of everything else, including virtues, including fame, including... Um, higher aspirations so there is a connection there perhaps with what's happening today as in today today <laughs> yes I, I yes I, I I think so um, although I wonder like given how quickly things are changing that that even people who are healthy or who are kind of uh, recognized as being healthy are now being um, you know condemned as you know as being uh, you know, insensitive or too healthy. Um, yeah, or or they're too or or they're too, or they're um, you know too high on the hierarchy and, and they need to be pulled down. Right. Yes, there's always this uh, this uh, fear, and uh, you know an, another image or that sprang as you described this end scene of the metamorphosis is the very typical idea of. Uh, you know, the dragon slaying myth that uh, we've touched upon on, on Ancient Greece Revisited on our main channel, whereby, you know, it's, it's very typical a trio, the, the, the woman, the princess, the maiden who gets abducted by a hideous monster and a hero who comes to save her by slaying the monster. So who's the, the monster in this story of metamorphosis is very clear. It's a giant cockroach living in a human room <laughs> and uh, who's the maiden is also very clear is the sister there's no hero to save the day but when the monster dies then uh the the maiden is ready for marriage but it's inverse it's like we're seeing it from the monster's point of view yes that's yeah. uh and how how does that relate to modernity the modern condition yeah so you're you're talking about um a kind of um of reversal, right, of a switch in, in roles and also in uh, valuations. I, you know, like the kind of heroic story, uh, the heroic tale, uh, you know, went out of fashion, right, uh, in, um, in the 20th century, right? Um, I mean, it was still there in the 19th century, um, but uh, in the 20th century, you know, like um, serious art and literature was not about, you know, heroes sort of rescuing um, you know, people, right? That, that something had uh, changed. Um, you know, it could be you know, sort of the power of um, the masses, right? Of, or the power of institutions um, that, uh, you know, that in which the individual plays a very, very small role, right? Or, or no longer has the same kind of significance, you know, as, um, as he did in, you know, in, in, you know, in earlier times. He's more like um, a part in a machine. Uh, yes, um, or or he doesn't have any kind of connection to uh, any kind of spiritual tradition, right? That would enable him to 
um, you know, think differently or rise above the circumstances. Yes, it, and it's interesting, even war stories like that of uh, Hemingway have this despiritualization. Yes. They're not, they're war stories, um, but and Hemingway does uh, allude to virtue and to bravery, which he recounts all, all the time, but there's a de it's a despiritualized bravery. It's, bra it's bravery almost just for the sake of it. Um, it's not... It's not bravery for fame everlasting, as it would be in Homer. It's not bravery for God, as it would be for a medieval knight or 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 a Muslim knight. And uh, mm -hmm. it's not for any transcendent, uh, everlasting, eternal source. It's almost like a shadow of of a virtue. Would you agree? Yes, I I think that's a really great way of of um, of putting it. Um, a shadow the shadows of, of the old virtues, right? That that's what uh, modern um, authors can uh, write about. Right? Um, and, but at the same time, it's, um, I, I think as you're saying that there's this kind of loss of this, of um, the despiritualization of virtue. Um, what we're also finding, I think is, is also the loss of insight. Mm, right. What, that, what do you mean by that? That people also become less profound, less deep. Um, you know that that certainly, like in a, um, it's a kind of a dynamic where not only okay, so that you have you can have people who um, engage in a kind of life of action, or praise it in in the way that um, Hemingway does, but it seems to really lack any kind of real um, relationship to uh, the everyday world. Right, mm. it, 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 it's a kind of a compartmentalized um, experience. It's you know? very so existentialist is, in a way. Yes, yes. So it doesn't lead to a particular a way of life. Do you know of any authors within modernity? I guess you'd, you'd be the right person to ask who have kept this heroic, uh, heroic narrative. Well, I think the obvious one that comes to mind is Ernst Jünger. Mm -hmm. In you know, Storm of Steel. Uh, in um, his, his diaries uh, that he kept during the Second World War are are um, really quite incredible. Um, yes, I mean he was he was in my mind. I was about to ask you um, because, it, it, and although I admit I haven't read the Storm of Steel yet, it's it's very soon on my on my reading list. I've I've read some other of his works uh, where he was. Um, he was um, worrying about w this loss of everything that you've said. Um, but it's, it's very interesting how Ernst Jünger was on the wrong side of history, ultimately, um, because yes. he was a part of the Nazi um, state at some point. He was, um, he was a captain in, in the Nazi army. And uh, from what I know, he was uh, responsible for, um, for executions, even. This, yes. this uh -huh. great... This great novelist, a part of the Western tradition, was respons was there in the firing squad, shooting at, um, at, at at whom they considered traitors, and some of whom would consider heroes. Now it's it's a very mixed up story, but he did. He was like this anti Hemingway, from what I understand. He wrote about the same war, the First World War, in a very different perspective, not nihilistic. Um, mm -hmm. But he was on the wrong side of history, so he's kind of lost, isn't he? Yes, I, um, I guess that's, or certainly, uh, in in some ways, kind of forbidden, right? Um, I, I, I mean, what's interesting about the diaries is how much he, uh, uh, how, you know, how, you know, how strong his opposition to Hitler is, um, and his own sort of concern that he would be, uh, you know, discovered as as part of, um, you know, as part of the plot. You know, certainly you're sort of on the, the fringes of, of, um, of the July 20th conspiracy. Um, yeah, and, I think uh, it's, uh, it's that film where Tom Cruise played um, uh, this, this patch eye. Uh, right? Yes, yeah. yes, that you're, you're talking about this incident. So Ernst Jünger was thought to have been part of this conspiracy to kill Hitler at the end of the war, to, so to um, finish the war. Um, it's unclear uh, what uh, role. I believe it's unclear what role he um, he actually had. I mean, other than that, he knew enough to be 
considered suspicious and that uh, there was an officer above him who protected him from uh, the subsequent roundup. Yeah, he's kind of forgotten now, but he was very, very famous back in the day. I mean, he was connected. Um, and would there be someone equivalent in Korea, uh, like a national? Because I know that in like in Japan, you have this writer who's very famous now, especially in conservative circles uh, called Mishima. Um, yes. that I know you, you are very aware of. And I, I read some of Mishima's works and it's very interesting because you don't necessarily see the connection with conservatism. You know, uh, The Sound of Waves is a beautiful little novel talking about a young boy of 18 falling in love with a young girl of 17, very normal, tries to win her over and eventually he succeeds and it's all in this little remote island off the coast of Japan. Um, very traditional, extremely traditional and Japan is just off the coast and it's like this new world that they never go or they visit but they're never interested and they live a life that could have been lived two, three, four hundred years ago. Um, is there a Korean Mishima? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't think so. I think it would be impossible for someone like that to uh, really emerge in um, South Korea, um, in part because of the military dictatorship. Um, also, um, there's a very, and then also the fact that it was under the U.S., um, you know, the orbit of, of um, you know, obviously the U.S. military. Um, and, 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 okay, so I, I think what is, uh, I mean, perhaps if, if there had been someone like this, Right. Um, that that person's work would probably be very um, I'm not an expert on uh, Korean literature, but I believe that that if there were someone like this, um, there might have been someone who, uh, you know, lived during the colonial period. But he would be uh, um, probably regarded as a, a Japanese collaborationist. Right. And again, considered um, uh, too um, politically toxic, you know, to uh, to deal with. Mm. Um, but the, the but because of these conflicts in in South Korea, it's very hard to um, like like yes, I mean there are authors who intellectuals who um, were in the South who then went to the North, um, you know right uh, you know during the Korean War. Um, there also uh, there's one interesting case of a um, leading filmmaker of the colonial period who had a very who was very productive you know under the Japanese. You know, um, who then fled to, I believe, to Indonesia and helped to found the um, film industry there. Okay. You know, so, it's, so it's a very interesting uh, uh, period where um, I, I think a lot of the work is still being done, but the, the sort of the shadow of the Japanese um, uh, occupation still hangs very heavy over this research, and so it's but, very difficult but, to make one's way through it. But why would that cancel the possibility of someone like Mishima? Because, for example, um, ju you know, Mishima committed suicide in public. Um, yes. So you have this great, again, people in the West can imagine, I don't know, Hemingway or, um, uh, you know, Kafka or someone. Co he committed suicide. He dressed as a samurai. He took his sword, this, this by then famous writer, and he tried to stage a coup. Um, which I'm sure he knew it would fail. It was more like a symbolic gesture. And he gave a speech in front of a military that was mostly indifferent. Uh, he talked about returning to the traditional values, the roots of Japan, and then he went in and committed seppuku. Um, could there be a Korean equivalent, someone who's who wants to die, sacrifice himself, talking about before sacrifice, uh, for the traditional Korean values. Hmm. Yeah, it's um, my sense is that the question. Uh, my sense is is no. Mm -hmm. um, that that it's very. I, I wouldn't expect such a figure to emerge uh, in South Korea, at least not in you know the, this current decade. I mean, perhaps in the in the future, um, but but there are a lot of. Um, how should we say, like, um, like Japan, I don't know, perhaps it might be related to the fact that the, the Japanese actually took the initiative to modernize, right? Like after, um, 
you know, Commodore Perry sailed into Tokyo uh, Bay with, um, uh, with his ships, um, the Japanese became uh, really uh, panicked and needed, realized they, you know, decided to become modern um, at any cost. Right. Um, and there are many samurai who opposed it, you know, who were then um, defeated uh, in a, you know, like they, they uh, in like the samurai uprisings of samurai who were, you know, anti-modern, um, who wanted to stick to the old ways were defeated. Another um, Tom Cruise film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Which so, was actually a great film, I have to say. Mm, the, uh -huh. the Last Samurai, I think it was called. Um, yeah, it was about a f historical event, an uprising. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it ends with this very sad scene where the samurais march on horseback and sword and they're gunned down by machine guns. So it's the old world being torn apart by yes. the modern world. Uh -huh. But it, is there this consciousness in Korea, in the Korean soul? In, in, in your idea, this tension between the old ways. Is there a Korean traditionalism m movement, let's say? Um, I, I think there's, within the realm of traditional culture, there are people trying to, uh, you know, k preserve like traditional music and certain kinds of traditional art and dance. Um, but it hasn't had, um, as far as I can tell, any kind of larger effect on the, the outside culture. Now, I think it's quite possible if um, the United States were to uh, enter into a period of, uh, of sharp decline and great hardship, where there would be an intense uh, desire to sort of go back and to uh, recover um, you know, these aspects of um, the Korean, of Korean tradition. I mean, I think also the rise of China may actually uh, you know, lead to, um, you know, such developments. I mean, it's quite possible. But at this point, um, I feel like the society is almost in a kind of wait and see mode, right? Mm -hmm. The United States has long been its kind of um, model, right? That we have to do things in such a way that, uh, you know, in, in the way that the Americans do it, right? Um, which will help us to become uh, prosperous. I mean, that was generally the path that they had taken um, like the, uh, that was the footing that, much, that, that the society was on. But now that the United States enters into this, um, you know, incredible, like, you know, political, <clears throat> cultural and social crisis, um, I think that may, may prompt some unusual changes and unusual uh, realignments in, um, in South Korea. Yes. Um, and in... In one of your papers that uh, you gave me before this interview called The Self Without Interest, you noticed how in a lot of science fiction films like uh, Mad Max, for instance, there is this portrayal of a return to not, not always traditional values in the good sense, some kind of tribalism. Whoever saw Mad Max can, can relate to that. Um, it's almost like history goes full circle in our imagination. We go into the future more and then we discover these technologies that can destroy everything and they do. And then we go back to a techno stone age. Yes. Hmm. What, yeah, so although, what, uh -huh. yeah, please. Yeah, although what I find really quite interesting about Mad Max is that, um, or at least the, you know, the second film, uh, Road Warrior, is how it seems to me to be about civil, the, the, the process of re-civilizing the tribe, right? Because, um, you know, the, uh, one of the characters is the feral child, right? The child who's been living, surviving on his own um, in the desert, who then links up with this um, sort of relatively civilized, you know, community. And... Um, you know, which is in turn threatened, right, by these, uh, this violent gang. Um, but it's by watching all the sacrifices, the sort of the heroic deeds of um, this community that the boy rises to leadership, right, mm -hmm. that the boy becomes civilized. And, and why do we need to go through this re-civilization of ourselves in our imagination since we're already civilized? Why, why are we producing these images? Yes. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. I mean, you know, the um, 
I, th I think maybe part of it might have to do with um, a kind of a desire to see what we're truly like, you know, if we don't have um, these comforts all around us. And what kind of people might we be, you know, if we, um, you know, suddenly had to fend for ourselves, to grow our own food, to kill and butcher our own animals, you know, the, this would um, be a, a, a tremendous shock, you know, for most of us. But then at the same time, it's not, you know, these are also, uh, you know, actions and behaviors that human beings have performed for centuries without even a second thought. You know, so perhaps it is by uh, living in these um, incredible, incredibly uh, sheltered environments, right, that we feel the need to recover something um, that we seem to be losing, right, that um, at least in imagination to be um, able to encounter, uh, you know, that, that part of us, right, that is connected to the past, right, that, that part of us that um, could survive, you know, and could maybe even enjoy, you know, living under conditions that are not modern. If need be, yes. Um, and I guess moving that, on, on that film, because you, you spend uh, a considerable amount of time studying uh, science fiction and the imagination that comes through science fiction, correct? Mm -hmm. And I guess one thing that we find in, in throughout science fiction is this um, ecstasy and anxiety over technology's role in our lives you know it's this we love we're drawn to it we love it but we're very afraid that it might be deadly to us and there's all these images of the cyborg the the terminator um on in the films of the 70s the 80s and the 90s and even before that between me and adam we've read um, you know two of the great uh, science fictional novels or um, dystopian futuristic novels of the 20th century All Worlds uh, 1984 and Aldous Huxley's Brave New World I've read uh, 84 Adam here uh, read uh, Brave New World and so I guess between us we can stitch together an image of the future and uh, All Worlds 84 has become very popular as of last year um, for obvious reasons, which means that people are sensing that there might be something coming in their near future that resembles what has been described by Orwell, which is a dystopian, technocratic, top-down, global society of total controls, cameras everywhere. Um, the technology, of course, he uses is old now. It's literal cameras, film cameras. You know, you can imagine someone needing to go there and take one tape and put another from memory but today it's very different we have mobile phones which are even better and I guess Adam uh, Huxley's Brave New World is a, is a different is it gives a different tone to this future world yeah with the cast and the, the top class and the middle and it, it's a class-based yeah. uh, society yeah and yes and they have a drug there called Soma, I think. I haven't read... I don't remember names because I read it when I was in school, so it's a long time ago, but... So I don't remember the details of it. Yeah. But I remember the essence, the essence of it. And uh, you could sense, possibly, yes, that the... In a, in a way that maybe the path that society could be taking could eventually lead to a dystopian uh, world like that. Could. Yeah. Back, back when you were at school. No, no, I'm, I'm talking about now. No, yeah, now, now, now it seems much more of a possibility. Um, so, 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 what is your take on these, on these two, on these two novels? Yeah, it's um, it's very interesting. Uh, you know, one thing that I, I think maybe um, we often uh, don't remember is that Brave New World was actually uh, written first. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. came out 17 years before 1984, and it was published in... So Brave New World was published in 1932, right, before World War II. Okay. Which, um, again, like, um, when I, the, the, I... And I didn't know that, but I, when I discovered that recently, it, it kind of really uh, uh, very, you know, shocked me. Um, I came across this. I, I was only made aware of this because of... Um, I was reading um, about... Um, a, uh, a Polish writer 
uh, Tadeusz Borowski, who um, was arrested by uh, the Gestapo um, in, in occupied Poland and was sent to Auschwitz. Right? Um, he wrote a famous collection of short stories called This Way for the Gas, Ladies and Gentlemen. And mm -hmm. the book that um, Borowski had with him when he was arrested was Brave New World. Okay. Interesting. So it's, very interesting. It, it, yeah, it, it's very... Uh, I don't know, there's just a juxtaposition on, you know, of having a book about a world that makes everyone happy, right, in the pocket of a man who's about to be sent into hell on earth. Yes. Right, to, to the concentration camp is, is, is just... A very um, powerful image. Yeah, it's uh, very shocking uh, to consider that. Um, I would say that um, in some ways what... Um, I, I think, you know, both novels uh, are... You know, incredibly, um, you know, powerful and um, and and you know, yeah, no question that that they're prescient, right? That you know, we do seem to be heading to um, a kind of world like we already have a world where you know, it's very easy to access pornography, right? Um, you know, like certainly that prop aspect of of um, Brave New World has come uh, true. In '84, and, and... what was interesting is that in, in this very bleak world, colorless, tasteless, that was described, I mean, just mm -hmm. the foods they were eating in, in uh, or was 84, he, he described this like boiled cabbage. You can imagine the color. That everything was tasteless in that world, yet they did have pornography, um, state-sponsored, of course, because everything was state-sponsored. We have, yeah. you know, you know, we we have a kind of contradiction in our thought with Michael regarding these subjects when we talk uh, together, and he always, you know, generally generally we're on the same uh, same uh, course of, you know, our thoughts are similar, but on this specific subject of dystopian worlds and uh, where the world is heading and all these things, we usually have a contradiction on uh, the way we see it, but. Uh, we don't really have, but what what I want to say is, we want my, to... my 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 uh, opinion regarding dystopian worlds is, they will always seem dystopian to us, with the current knowledge that we have. So, for example, every uh, world like Brave New World, 1984, all these things that are considered dystopian, they are dystopian for us with the knowledge we have, the way we live now, the way the knowledge of all history, the knowledge of everything we have as a, as a society in whole. But what I uh, try to say to Michael is, which is, again, what I'm going to say is utopian, that people who actually live in that world, that, utop that, that dystopian world, without all prior knowledge that we do have now, will actually feel like they are in a utopia. I don't know if that makes any sense, but... Uh, it, it does make sense to me, at least. Yes, that... Uh, yeah, one question is how this dystopian, utopian world looks to us, but we are not living in it. So people who are born in it, what will they think? Perhaps they yeah. will be in heaven. Yeah, or perhaps they might think that it's normal, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, uh, without know, I, I think that, without yeah. having any prior knowledge of the world as it used, yeah, it used to be. To be. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, I, mean, I think it's very difficult to, um, I, I think as you live in any kind of society, to think of it as, as utopia, in, in part because, you know, like, yeah, the, we, we always have a certain amount of frustration and difficulty. Uh, we have to struggle in life. Um, but um, th yes, certainly I can see that people in 1984 and Brave New World would see their environment, their you know the society they live in as you know as completely uh, like you know, normal and, and that there is also no alternative, right? This is how this is the only way to live. Although, if I, if I remember correct, in uh, Brave New World there is there is a glitch, a bug, let's say, in the system. If I if I'm not mistaken, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So I mean, as in one of the characters can actually think outside of that current world. Uh, yes, uh, the, um, the the character John, um, the savage, right, mm -hmm. who um, comes from a um, I'm trying to 
I'm trying to remember, he seems to come from a different kind of, uh, grown up in a different, um, like an island, right, an isolated place, you know, where he had some kind of ties to, um, or, or knowledge of the, uh, uh, of the older world, mm-hmm. of the world um, gone by. And, um, you know, it, so... It, it, mm-hmm. just, just to see how desirable this world might be, there's a very, very interesting connection. Um, uh, Huxley's brother, Huxley, the writer of Brave New World, his brother, Julian Huxley, was one of the founding members of UNESCO. Oh. And UNESCO, in their original declaration, which I suggest people should read, because these large organizations, they're not conspiracies, they're actually um, existent, and they do influence our lives Mm -hmm. tremendously. The actual declaration written by Julian Huxley is very dystopian slash utopian, however you want to see it. It's he's definitely talking about a reengineering of the human creature uh, Mm -hmm. to conform to certain values. So I can imagine these two, you know, Aldous Julian sitting on the dinner table, just bouncing ideas, one writing a novel, the other starting UNESCO. Uh-huh. Does there seem to be a connection between fiction and reality, like these, these dystopian scenarios are actually unfolding in front of our very eyes? Hmm. Yeah, well... Um... I mean, it makes, I think it makes a lot of sense, um, you know, that certainly um, the period of the 30s and 40s and 50s, you know, was a time when, you know, there was a lot of faith that modern institutions could, you know, fundamentally transform the world, right? Um, and, you know, and, and I think this was true, uh, you know, whether in the Soviet Union or, you know, Hitler's Germany, Right, uh, as well as in the United States and Britain and France, um, you know. So it's you know. So yes, it, it doesn't surprise me that there would be this kind of um, say like influence, right? Or um, or or maybe it's a, a kind of a two-way street, right? Where um, perhaps uh, um, Aldous Huxley was influenced by the ideas of Julian in terms of um, what um, you know he he imagined. Um, um, his better world would be. Yeah, perhaps it could be the other way around. I haven't thought about this before. It's interesting. Uh, I don't even know who's the youngest, I think, Julian. But but, uh, yeah, but back to what Adam mentioned, I guess, you know, um, doing this show and having conversations. um, Yeah, we have this agreement, disagreement. We agree that there's kind of two ways to go about the future. One would be a return to... Uh, a more warlike state where differences are accepted as differences, the claims to the will to power is the norm and uh, each group's interest, whether city or state or race or or society, culture, um, wanting to dominate over others, that is accepted. War is the father of us all, as Heraclitus said, and that is the world, and that's going to be a world that we've lived there before, but now it's going to be with more technology. And the other is this globalist, pacifist society of top-down controls, where these instincts need to be subdued so that in order to keep the peace. And it seems to me that we are heading more towards that second because it seems to me that all this the identities that can lead to a claim to a sort of will to power to say i am that person i am a man and as a man or i am a european and as a european or as a christian and these identities are being suppressed so it seems that we're moving more to this second what what is your view on this yeah it's a well, it's a very, um, I think it's a very difficult and in many ways a kind of a bleak situation, right? Um, you know, that it, it seems to me that the kinds of institutions that, um, that we've set up in, um, you know, in the West are, are falling apart. You know, they're not able to bring about peace. They're not able to resolve conflicts. And they have a kind of, 
tendency to um, attack anything that has any kind of energy and strength and any kind of promise for the future. Vitality, perhaps. Yes, all in the name of, of bringing about peace or maintaining peace. Right? So it's a peace that, um, that, that I think is, is very, um, you know, that certainly I think many people would find to be very unhealthy. You know, and um, and also uh, spiritually um, deadening. Mm. You know, so and this has and, happened and then, before. It's interesting mm. you mentioned Ernst Jünger, and he was part of a whole generation of Germans who saw this in the Weimar Republic, in the in the democ in the liberal democracy that was largely imposed on Germany between the First and Second World War, uh, which was a time of peace, not prosperity necessarily, but peace. Yes. And uh -huh. uh, these writers like Jünger uh, or like Leo Strauss that I keep mentioning or like Martin Heidegger in the philosophy department, they saw this peace as un undesirable, not because it w did not bring health it brought more health than either the First or Second World War. The Weimar Republic, by health standards, was superior. But what these writers and philosophers saw is that deadening of the spirit. And they believed, in one way or another, it was worth fighting that for that spirit rather than for health. Correct? Um, so maybe I guess we could call it physical security. Yes, yes. Right? Um, although there was a huge amount of of, um, I guess, of a very, uh, um, should we say, like, you know, very kind of a decadent sexuality in, in the Weimar, Weimar Republic. Republic. Yeah, that, um, you know, that uh, those, um, a lot of prostitution, you know, all kinds of um, cabarets. Yeah, forbidden, you know, like taboo uh, forms of sexuality suddenly becoming public. Mm. Right. Um, and that, um, you know, and, and then there's a, also a kind of a real um, kind of a mockery of, um, you know, of, of tradition or or even of convention, you know, which, um, you know, but also of, the, you know, of, of the very things that can hold a society together. Yes, and, um, which is something that we see now, in a sense, because. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, both Brave New World and 84 had pornography and the Weimar Republic had pornography and uh, we have lots of it now. So it seems that these two things go hand in hand. Yeah, um, and then also w one thing I think that maybe neither Huxley nor Orwell could foresee was um, the sharp decline in the birth rates, mm. right, of... of, um, of sort of um, the more uh, you know, kind of developed cultures, more developed nations. Does this happen right. in Korea as well? Yes. I mean, the birth rate is very, very low here. It's lower than in, um, in most of Europe. Oh, even lower. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but also they didn't anticipate the, uh, we say the, the increase of birth rate before the decline now. Because uh, during the 50s, 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an increase and a decrease. There's an increase globally, of course. The population has been growing steadily and exponentially. But there's a decrease in some groups like uh, Europe and, as you mentioned, Korea. Yes, and also Japan. I believe China is also um, trying to increase its population. Uh, they now have a two-child policy. Yeah, because they had a one-child policy, which mm -hmm. is a very yeah. effective way of halving the population. I guess there's another point where me and Adam uh, are disagreeing because he th he thinks that ultimately most problems that we're witnessing throughout the world can be boiled down to uh, this inflation, the hyperinflation of population, overpopulation. Yes. Would you agree? Like, or or is it an easy way to just blame everything on a kind of half natural phenomenon? Well, I I think that. Um, a low birth rate, I think, has um, all kinds of, um, of, uh, you know, knock-on consequences, right? Um, you know, because people have generally expected in the past to be able to have a family. If they're not able to have a family, 
uh, it is um, in some ways that you know they're losing something fundamental, right? Um, you know, like something fundamental to their conception of life, right? Um, and I think for many people, it's having children that really gives them a feeling of love and belonging and purpose in life, right? Um, I mean, you know, like uh, like not everyone or most people are not, you know, equipped to live as artists and scientists who are, you know, who are um, you know, completely, so completely dedicated to their vocation, right, that um, they, um, you know, like uh, avoid um, having other obligations. Mm -hmm. Like, um, like the fulfillment, I think, of really of ordinary life lies in, in having a family. And, yes, and um, it's, I think when so that's, I think it, spreads to the whole population when a whole nation um, has these low birth rates. It's not only a technical matter that, uh, you know, someone needs to pay for pensions, etc. Is that that nation feels it's dying. Yes. And also it um, loses the ability to think long term. Right. Fewer people are willing to think long term if they do not have children. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, why not just enjoy myself? You know, why try to protect the environment? You know, why try to, you know, do like, you know, make sacrifices if my if my life is the only thing that I have. And and so I think it's it's really um, you, you, what was it like, uh, like, you know, like our historical consciousness. Right. Um, you know, ha often has to do with the fact that we you know, we're able to interact with our grandparents who lived in a different kind of age, different age. And then, and then we have children, you know, and that, um, there's a kind of, um, atomization, you know, that is, I, I think that can have very dangerous effects, uh, and very negative effects on a society if people are not able to have children. Yes. Yes. That, that's, that's very interesting. And, uh, well, speaking of science fiction, there was a film, um, with a childless world where people uh, there was some kind of disease that uh, prevented people from being able to conceive children and the world was yeah. dying I don't remember the I think you know uh, children of men children yeah. of men yeah yeah so maybe that betrays some anxiety there uh, yes I, 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 I think so there's a lot of um, like like I, I think there is a lot of worry um, in um, in Korea about, um, you know, what the future will be like, you know, if um, as fewer and fewer people are, you know, having children, getting married, it seems to lead to a kind of very lonely kind of life. But you know, the, um, the, the, the problem of the way I see it, of overpopulation is that the, the increase in the population happened very rapidly and very suddenly during the 20th century. It was not uh, a, a steady curve going upwards like it used to be at, uh, up until that point. With the technological advance, the medical advance and everything, the curve became exponential. geometrically exponential. And that mm. is, in my opinion, what has caused many problems in uh, mm. our modern world now. It's not, yeah, I, 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 it's not, it's not the increase of the population, it's the rate of increase, of increase which was very sudden and the world was not, in my opinion, prepared for such an increase. It was not built. It was not developed in a way to accommodate all these people. Yes. Um, I mean, that is uh, interesting that um, that certainly, um, like, like I've, I've read that, uh, you know, in, you know, for example, in China, uh, what would happen is that um, you in a in a sort of a prosperous time, uh, more people would have children, um, and as there are more children, uh, they uh, the population would go mo would grow past the carrying capacity of the land, which in turn led to famine, right? Um, and um, many people dying, uh, and what would then happen is that the poor would die, and the children of the rich would become the peasants, uh, in um, you know, several generations down the line. That, that sounds like a good uh, science fiction uh, yeah. story. Yes, but, but that's history, um, right? Um, you know, that, um, you know, that they're try, you know, trying to control, 
like you know Korea also had like um, like for for a time when the population was small, uh, women, for example, had many rights. You know, they, women could inherit property, for example. But once the population began to expand, and um, and uh, and the country and the country was running, the kingdom was running out of land. Uh, they introduced a new law saying that only men, um, and I think only really the first son could inherit property. Mm, so it doesn't get diluted too much. Yes. Yeah. yeah talking about these um, these morals that have to do with practical concerns, um, like what are the main anxieties that you find? Um, in science fiction when you analyze the the genre and when you analyze the predictions that we're trying to make about the future i think uh, one of the greatest fears is the loss of freedom right um you know and the loss of individuality you know that we um you know that the uh, future society will try to correct us right or correct our minds so that we only are able to think a certain way or feel a certain way, right? That will be passive, you know, turned into sheep, you know, that can be uh, easily managed by, um, you know, the the state. But that is, yeah, that is a dominant Im imaginary there. Yet it's also <laughs> seems to becoming a reality, at least partially. So it's strange, like someone, you know, uh, humanity being afraid of a potential. And rather than trying to avoid it, actually moving towards it. Yes. It, it reminds me of, you know, like driver's instructions where they say, don't look at the danger, look away, because that's where your car is going to head. So it's like, you know, we're looking at the danger so much, we're actually moving towards it. Mm. It's uh, transfixed us like the eyes of a snake. Yeah, kind of good uh, metaphor. Do you think science fiction had something to do with it? It just drilled this idea in our heads so much that we're actually turning it into a reality? Um, that's an interesting argument. I would be, yeah, I mean, it's quite possible. Uh, I mean, because the other side, of course, of, of the uh, fear of um, these institutions, you know, uh, robbing us of our freedom and our originality and our ability to think, is uh, the collapse of these institutions. You know, what, you know, like modern institutions falling apart and then forcing us back into, uh, you know, more, primitivism. Um, yeah, more primitive conditions, less developed conditions. And, mm. and so I think maybe one thing, you know, that, that sort of makes me wonder uh, is what if both of these things are happening at the same time? So, you know, both. what if, what if like we're living under a system that's trying to rob us of our freedom, you know, to uh, enforce certain a narrow range of ideas and to prevent us from challenge, you know, to prevent us uh, from um, dissenting and challenging the existing system. But at the same time, the system is falling apart. Mm, so it's trying to hold on to something. Um, yes, it's trying to hold on to something, but it's also um, going... Um, it's also, in, in some sense, losing its hold on reality. And you could say that it's go, beginning to go insane because its methods are, aren't working. Um, they're not working in the way that they expect them to work. A dub, double failure. Yes. Uh, yes. Double, yeah, so a double failure could be a positive, though, in the end. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it could be one yeah, success. It, <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, it, it, could be, uh, it, it could be positive, but... Um, but I think it will also, but even if it is positive, there probably will come like uh, nightmarish periods, you know, um, because I think, you know, periods of collapse are very chaotic, right? They're very unpredictable. So uh, you say that we're losing freedom nowadays, but if, uh, if somebody was to ask somebody at random somewhere in the world, would the answer be the same or would they feel that we are actually living in a more free uh, society now? Mm. Because in my head, it's what I told you now, that we overall as a society, we think that we are in a more free society nowadays. Even though 
like you said before, it seems like we are heading in a less free society. So. Yeah, I I think that um, probably I think it really very much depends on um, whether the person you're talking to is a, a kind of like a populist or a nationalist, or whether they are, you know, uh, fine, whether they're progressive and paradoxically supportive of the status quo. Right. Mm. So, so um, you know what I think of pro, um, like for example, I think with with liberals, I think uh, for them. Uh, Society has to change at a certain pace in order for them to feel secure, right? And, and the fact that there's uh, a lot of opposition to uh, liberalism is very disturbing, right? It's, uh, it's a kind them. of a source of, yes, it's a source of almost a kind of source of, um, you know, of, of like psychological trauma, I would say. Um, you yeah, know, it, and, then on, in, and then on the other hand, you have people who, you know, also feel who feel by contrast that they're losing their freedom they want to defend tradition you know, they don't want to go uh, head headlong into um, a kind of a globalist world you know who um, I, I think you know, very much feel that um, you know you know who are really really worried about the dystopian scenarios that we are um, talking about right so so it seemed that for the one so it seemed that for many progressives it's almost as though you know, 1984 has become a kind of a positive program. Yeah, which is right? ironic. Uh, yeah. Yes, it's very ironic. People who call themselves liberal today, they, they often act more illiberally than people who call themselves conservatives. I think that there's also a lack of the definition of the word freedom. Because I think people are talking about freedom, but everybody has a different freedom in their mind, in their head. Yes. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... And I guess for me, like what I'm uh, talking about is uh, um, freedom of thought, intellectual freedom, right? Uh, the um, uh, right to explore different ideas. I mean, even ideas that are, what, not liberal, right? Um, that are uh, very critical of the status quo. Yes, to hold ideas that are against the status quo. And we see this, uh, and I think we see this attack in language, just, you know, because as of yet, the state cannot intervene into your brain directly, but um, they can try to intervene into the language. And because there's this mysterious connection between thinking and speaking thoughts and language, which we, we haven't understood yet, but there is a connection there, we feel that perhaps by manipulating one, which is more easy, language, forbidding certain words, stre changing the meaning of others, that do we, they, we are going to eventually change our thoughts. Yes. Is there something similar happening perhaps in Korea? Um, um, I'm not quite sure. Um, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, um, there is, um, I mean, to some, it's interesting. I mean, there was a kind of protest by young people that um, their teachers were forcing them to adopt uh, you know, kind of doctrinaire left-wing positions, mm. um, especially anti-Japanese positions. <laughs> you know, so there's a certain kind of local element to um, Korean um, politics that doesn't really quite map uh, onto um, some of these Western, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, ideological divides. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost like Japan has absorbed the, your conservatism and then you f they, they feel they have to push against it. Yeah, or um, or young people, I think they don't want, like the sort of the people who are in charge of Korea, running the country, are kind of the equivalent of the '60s generation in the West. Okay. You know, they're the people who protested against the military dictatorship. You know, who then um, took over positions of power after you know the country became a democracy. But of course, um, you know, like you know, but any group that holds power will generate an opposition. Right, especially among young people. And so I think young people are kind of engaged in a kind of a search for um, ideas that, um, you know, might go in some very, you know, different directions, you know, from what um, we might expect coming from the West. Yeah, and, uh, you know, in the West, the, the prime example, I guess, would be Tony Blair, who 
in one of his speeches just before he was elected said I'm part of the rock and roll generation <laughs> mm -hmm. so you know he came like guns blazing on this one and he was young and they had a rock song written for him and uh, but when he came into power he was not as liberal I mean he not notoriously sided with the United States and the invasion of Iraq he um, he he did not he did not he was not very rock and roll while in power <laughs> uh -huh. so this but how does because it's another issue that you've dealt upon this 60s counterculture the 60s revolution that kind of turned the world upside down um like was there a korean 60s because i can tell you that in greece greece was a very special situation because although we were in europe and because of tourism that we had lots of since then um mm -hmm. we had the, an influx of these ideas there were a few places in Greece that were considered like hippie paradises like in Crete for instance people would go there and live in caves for about for a month and Matala was a place but then at the same time 67 we had a dictatorship a military dictatorship which was of course not very uh compatible with these uh, ideas and we had that until 74 um in 74 there was this local event that was um turned into a national holiday later on called the revolt of the polytechnic um 73 actually adam just uh, uh corrected me 1973 um uh, some students went into the polytechnic the the uh, the technical university of engineers and they closed the doors they took over and they started broadcasting uh, they created like a small radio transmitter and they started bro broadcasting messengers of l liberty, of freedom against the dictatorship. And if you ask someone like my father, they barely remember it. It was a very local event. But then, partly correctly, partly not, it's a different discussion. It was blown into this. It's it's one of our few national holidays, actually. Um, oh, wow. And uh, it was perhaps this just this version of the 60s that we'd never had okay how were things in korea what was korea in the 60s how was the rock and roll generation there uh, i mean it's a very restricted time because of the military dictatorship um you know you don't really have a kind of a uh kind of a youth movement really until the 1980s you know plus the 1960s were a period of great poverty in um in south korea you know, the, um, it was in um, 1961, I believe, where um, you had the um, government being overthrown and the military dictator, the, um, you know, Park Chung hee uh, taking over. Um, and, and so this is a period where um, the country was being mobilized to um, become modern, right, to uh, industrialize itself. And, uh, you know, it was a period of great hardship and, and grinding poverty. But also a lot of the changes that um, you know that that made the country into what it is today began to take place in the '60s. Um, I mean, it, in many ways, um, you know, like it's uh, um, the country had you know was like in you know 1961 that was still only eight years after the end of the um, or the uh, the ceasefire that ended active hostilities in the Korean War, um, and so it was a very different uh, um, you know kind of um, of historical situation, but it's in the '80s where you have lots of young people going out and protesting, uh, and um, and also listening to rock and roll. Um, not going into it, such extremes as uh, people in the West did, though. Um, what you you had, I think, in the '70s and '80s, were um, when young people uh, decided to choose the path of radicalism, uh, they would leave school and go work in factories, you know, to try to mobilize the working class. Okay, so so communism became pretty popular. Yes, but it was interesting to it's interesting like how seriously they took it, right? In the sense that they were willing to give up comfortable lives, you know, in order to um, bring to about work in um, yeah to bring about political change. I mean, they were not uh, you know limousine liberals. That's I mean, a difference really... with Europe, I'd say, because the the new the younger generation in even the sixties they would not 
do that. They would write an article or a book, but not go work in a factory. Yeah. Um, so it was a pretty uh, big, um, you know, pretty big movement. Um, and, you know, there's also a lot of pressure among students to um, not go to class and, um, and show up for the protests. Um, you know, so, um, you know, so, so, it's, you know, so there was, uh, so I guess you could say that the um, oppositional culture had a very collectivist um, uh, mm. significance, a collectivist meaning that it didn't have in the West, right? Um, and what was the relationship with North Korea, which we haven't mentioned, but North Korea is this supposedly communist state? Did that give an example or a bad example to these young people? Well, I think for the more radical ones, it was a very positive example. They really, you know, wanted, you know, took the side of the North. Um, but to be sure, in the 1960s, uh, North Korea was actually uh, richer than South Korea. Mm -hmm. So for the 60s and 70s, um, the North actually, uh, they had more natural resources, they had more industry. And so it seemed as though in the co this Cold War conflict that the communist side would, um, you know, had most of the advantages. Okay. And that Could, began, that because... began to change in the 70s and 80s. But, um, but there's an interesting uh, story of an a activist who, um, you know, defied the government and flew to Pyongyang, the northern capital, where she was, um, you know, greeted by a, a cheering crowd of people. And when she came back to um, South Korea, she was arrested um, mm. and put in prison. But what I think, but the impact I think of, of her visit was sort of the opposite of what um, you know the radicals had, had in the South had expected, because um, you know, the punish her punishment was relatively mild. Um, you know, she was also wearing clothes that were um, you know of a quality that was uh, that many people in the North envied, right? Um, that it highlighted a lot of the ways in which the North was falling behind the South. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, you I know, think so, we can find equivalents with the Soviet Union here in Greece, people visiting the Soviet Union. But, but you know, now I guess North Korea now is seen as this almost ridiculous kind of, you know, because the, the leader is often portrayed in the media as this lo having lost, total lost touch with reality, weird haircut. It's almost like a yes. parody. Um, how do Korean or younger consider this today? I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, kind of suspicion uh, towards the North. Um, you know, like, especially among young people, um, like the idea of human rights is very important and uh, they don't like the fact that um, and a good number of them don't like the fact that the current government in the South um, is not uh, pressing the issue of human rights in the North. Um, I think people are very, very aware of the great poverty and hardship that um, you know that the people in the North have to um, endure. Um, but then, on the other hand, um, the, from what I can gather, there's been a lot of, or sort of an unexpected degree of liberalization in the North which is kind of surprising given um, the kinds of economic problems um, that they've had, right? And from, uh, and, and, and so some of the um, recent scholarship about the North has said that you know, there's a terrible famine uh, in um, North Korea in the 1990s, um, you know, in which um, uh, like, um, like something, that I think about, a, uh, it was a four year period, I think where maybe about, um, you know, anywhere from uh, 200 to 3 million North Koreans died of, of hunger. Mm. Um, but the interesting thing about the response of the North Korean government was actually not to uh, consolidate power in, um, in, in the head of the Communist Party, right, in the leader. Right? In fact, what they did was they responded to it by uh, splitting up, dividing the powers between um, uh, the military the party, and the leader. Mm. Very so, contrary to what you would have thought. Yes, I mean, you'd expect in a crisis that, um, you know, that you, you would hand power over to one person. But in fact, um, they did the opposite. 
You know, so um, I think it, with, with North Korea, we generally see Kim Jong-un, you know, the, the overweight, uh, chubby uh, leader with the bad haircut. Yeah. But um, I, I, think it's, I, I think the reason why he's overweight is that he has to deal with multiple factions that are vying for power and, that, <laughs> and, and, and he's stressed out. <laughs> okay. So, so he's not that buffoon that uh, is portrayed in the West. Yeah, and that he probably has one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. Yes, yes, that's something we don't see. Um, and y just staying on the subject of films, uh, I have to mm -hmm. ask you, you know, um, there's this film that I saw a long time ago called uh, Old Boy, oh, <laughs> uh, <yes. laughs> the famous Korean film. And not, not, not to make too much of it symbolically, but it, it also, although it wasn't political in that uh, straight sense, it reminded me a little bit of a, another film that I saw by Kosturica, where um, a European. Um, the, so the premise is that people, uh, you know, in, in that film, that people go underground and a whole era passes and then they come out as if uh, from sleep. And in Old Boy, the Korean film, you have this person who's been abducted and a whole years pass and he's in that dungeon and then he's released. Does that mean something for you as a cultural critic on one side and as a Korean? Um, I think it's a really wonderful film. It's, it's one of my favorites. Um, and I'm glad you brought it up because uh, I think it, it, it captures something really quite I think really emblematic about the rise of South Korea, um, you know, from you know this uh, devastated, impoverished country to being one of the wealthiest, you know, countries uh, in the world. And it has a lot to. And what I, I think is really quite marvelous about the film is that it's um, about a man who is, you know, before he's imprisoned, is kind of um, a Kind of not he's not a good person right he's drunk he fights a lot with his wife he cheats on his wife all the time um and he's not uh he's not a you know he's not a virtuous person but by being in prison by being in, uh, you know um, in, in prison for um you know for that period of um you know, i believe it's about uh um you know uh, like a about 15 years, years yes yeah that he emerges with this kind of singular purpose right mm. to achieve knowledge and so the film i think is really um i mean in, in, in some ways it's not uh it, it it's very uh you know it's kind of western i would say um because of course uh, the kind of story behind it is the story of oedipus mm. is it you know, I, the me I never saw that <laughs> yeah because it's about um wanting knowledge so badly that you're willing to um you know, mutilate yourself, mm. right, as the price of receiving that knowledge. Yeah, it's a very interesting tangent. Uh, I did not see that, uh, did not see that uh, uh, coming. And um, also, uh, to add on this film, apart from the story and the, everything behind the story, as a film itself is a piece of art and one of the best films that I've seen. Or yes, I, it's yeah, it's um, certainly one of one of my favorites. I, I think uh, Park Chan Wook's uh, the film that he made after that, uh, um, Lady Vengeance. I think is is even better. We have to uh, see that that one. What's the title yeah. again? Uh, Lady Vengeance or Sympathy for Lady Vengeance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in last year there was a film uh, called Parasite. I think uh, mm. the Korean film, if I'm yes. not mistaken. Mm. And that showed something on, I guess, social classes and et cetera, uh, the, the, the rich and the poor. And, you know, speaking, speaking of which, um, a book that you suggested that I read and I read part of it is called The Revolt of the Elites, okay, um, b uh, by Christopher Lash. And uh, it touches on many subjects that, are kind of dear to my heart and we're trying to promote especially in the show um, but it's 
essentially it's a, it's a play on an older the title is a play on an older book called the Re the revolt of the masters and the, in the revolt of the elites it, what it suggests is that there is a rising global elite that emerged the book was written in the 90s so it's pretty dated considering how prescient it was and it, it, it explains this rise of the elites not as a conspiracy, but as a natural consequence of the very ideas that founded uh, the American democracy. You know, the ideal of um, the ideal of the self-made man um, that was a noble idea back when they were breaking the frontiers and moving, as we've seen in many films, to the West. And then they broke the frontiers. And I, I guess they came into the same problems that the ancient Greeks after they had settled in Greece and they were no longer fighting like we read in Homer. And they had to find another way of choosing who's the best man to rule. And in the States, they found this more educational system promoting the best businessman, the best manager, the best money makers, essentially, which eventually led to a money making elite. Did, did I get that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and w what is your take on that book in relation to what is actually happening today? Yes, well, I mean, we see a kind of, of um, you know, meritocracy, right? It, it's um, on the basis of meritocracy that, um, that we have a kind of a global elite uh, emerging, right? They want to take the best people, you know, f across the world, right? And we'll bring them to Harvard or um, one... Uh, Oxford or some other elite university, right? And um, and we will give them, train them in the in the values that global citizens should have. Um, and because they're the best, you know, they will, you know, create this enlightened system, you know, uh, no matter where they are uh, in the world, right? No matter what their their country of origin. But but the destination that they all have is the same, right? <laughs> You know, it's a kind of a, um, it's an attempt to create a kind of a, a, a worldwide um, liberal, you know, society, you know, where, um, and then uh, the other danger, of course, is that it creates elites that are disconnected, you know, from the people they lead. And with the traditions they came from. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and, and so it leads to this kind of problem of, you know, that we think that meritocracy uh, is the fairest system, right? Like, let's have the most talented people rise to the top. But in practice, it seems that that when these really talented people rise to the top, they turn out to be strangely blind. Mm. You know, there's something about the kind of education that that they receive that that make you know that causes them, you know, to lose touch with um, with where they came from. It, they lose the ability to. Uh, see the world in a in a way that is different from what they from how they've been taught to see it. In, uh, can, please, I want to add in, at this point maybe, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a fan of logic and things that make sense in my head at least. So, since I was a kid, the way I was brought up anyway, in my head, uh, logic played a great deal. And uh, what I see now, in especially. In the last, I don't know, let's say three, four, five years, perhaps it, since 2011, <laughs> the yeah, breakpoint. Uh, I feel that uh, logic is a curse for the ones who have it, and unneeded for the ones who don't. If that makes sense. So I feel that people who take decisions don't take decisions that don't make sense. They, there is no logic behind it, at least in my head, and uh, it's possibly one of the reasons that people see or regard as conspiracy theories behind it. But uh, we have another friend, actually the director of photography of our show, Constantinos, who believes that the people in power, the leaders, like you said, they are actually dumb, if we can say this. They are short-sighted and they basically take irrational decisions based on the spot without any prior thinking and uh, a plan, let's which say. is a very common view these days to to regard as our our global leaders as literally dumb. But uh, you know, I, you know that I disagree with this. But yeah, it's a very common common view. Mm -hmm. 
So yes, it doesn't surprise me. I, I, I mean, I've been reading um, about the French Revolution, and I have to say that uh, many of the uh, some of the leaders um, of the um, of the French monarchy right before the revolution, I think, were also, you know, quite inept hmm. and also very blind and unable to recognize the fact that they were blind. But being blind is different to being dumb. Uh, I have an, another friend to the, the, the person that Adam uh, mentioned who is 100% with this view. And at some point I said, I said, man, you, you just have this, what example did I use? I think like this Woody Allen version of politics where, where, where it's just a series of stupid incompetent mistakes that and he said yes that's exactly it you know and he he imagined almost like this this parody which i disagree i i think that blindness can be one thing absolutely but not unintelligence and necessarily do, do you separate the two um yeah i yeah i'm, I'm not sure I, I i guess maybe um Maybe another way to approach this uh, question, uh, because I think it's possible for intelligent people to be dumb. I think it's possible for intelligent people, highly educated people, to be blind. Uh, but I, but I think one thing, one idea that I found that kind of um, is helpful for th you know for sorting out some of these issues is that you know John Baudrillard, uh, the French uh, theorist, makes the point that the global, uh, the people who run the lead the global world. They want to be seen as doing obvious good. Yes. Right? The system, global system is based on the fact that it is obviously good. So that even if you question it, um, you have to be demonized. You have to be condemned. Right? And, and so they've given themselves a kind of an impossible task. How can you defend something that is obviously good? It means that you can't defend it. Right? They don't want to defend it because you know, they, don't, they haven't about bothered I suppose maybe it's they're, they're lazy. They haven't bothered to develop the kind of intellectual apparatus to be able to defend what it is that they're standing for. Yeah, that I can believe. I think they're, what, they're, what they're doing is living out a program that was set by people other than them. Yes. They might be an agenda without actually, you know, people in a dark room designing it. There might be an agenda that arises culturally. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, and I think maybe the people who are who set up the agenda, um, they were by, you know, like they were in comparison to those leading us today, they were conservatives, right? Or they knew about conservatism, they knew about tradition, so they knew not to go too far. They were prudent, right? yeah. Yeah, they they had they had um, the kind of background, educational cult and cultural background, which enabled them to behave prudently. <laughs> Yeah, like the teachings of the Greeks. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> but the, but then it it changed rapidly in the sixties, and and it seems like what we are seeing today is the agenda set by the the counterculture of the nineteen sixties rather than uh, these more traditional views. Because you 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 have things as extreme as you know transgender athletes being allowed to compete against their assigned gender. So a man who goes into uh, surgery essentially and comes out as a woman, for the, let's say for the sake of this conversation. Um, and now there's been legislation that would allow that man who was a man up until 25 and then at 26, he became a woman, 27, he's fully recovered at 28 to compete in wrestling against women. And, uh, you know, as I'm speaking these words, there's even a little alarm bell in my mind, to be honest, that this, what I just said publicly, might come back and bite me. And some kind of censorship could even arise, just for, just for mentioning it. So there's an agenda there, you know, because it's not just the legislation that would allow such people to compete against women it's the media that are going to promote it and who are going to censor any dissent and the politicians who are going to make public statements so 
without even connecting the dots and creating ground theories, there's a lot of dots there. A lot of things had to come in place for that very strange, almost surreal thing to happen. Because in my mind, it's still very surreal. Was how can someone who is a man until 25 then compete with a woman in wrestling? So, w- 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 it's what is actually being constellated? You think? Yeah, it's it's a it's a really uh, it's it's a real head scratcher, right? I mean, what is the good of the, all, all of this, right? Um, I mean, you know, women have fought for you know, a long time to get things like women's sports, right? You know, to be able to take part in these kinds of activities. Um, You know, and this kind of transgender issue, yes, I share with you uh, the kind of um, a certain reluctance even to um, bring it up, but it seems to me to be kind of like a litmus test. I mean, maybe maybe it's something that will go away once the test has been decided. Mm. And what is that um, test for, you think? (laughs) uh, It could be for transhumanism. Okay. Maybe maybe it's an attempt to get us acclimated to the idea uh, that some people, not all people, but some people should receive, you know, you know, these kinds of um, highly advanced medical treatments so that they can live, you know, extend their lives by 20 or 30 years. Mm. That that's very interesting. I've never thought about it this way. So, but the transhumanist agenda seems to be on the cards. Uh, yes, I mean, I think technologically it seems you know, because I think it's very much uh, technologically within uh, reach now. Um, you know, with um, this kind of met- new methods of, of life extension, um, I, I think it might also be related to the attempt to um, stamp out, you know, um, religion. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a way of getting, um, of striking at, uh, of characterizing people, you know, whether Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, you know, whatever religion, um, anyone who has a kind of a traditional attachment to religion, meaning that it should really sort of define your life and be an important part of your life. Your identity. It, yes, it's a way of, um, of pathologizing them. Yes, absolutely. Pathologizing, I think, is the is the correct word because now it seems that the vast majority of people consider religion in pathological terms. They they will say things like, "Oh, you know, it's just people are so afraid of death that they invent a god up there that doesn't exist," um, or you know, they want to believe in something. I keep meet, meeting a lot of people who say, "Oh, you know, people want to believe in something." Well, if you just scratch beneath the surface of their beliefs they are also uh, in that category you know and perhaps just you know our, our our colleague that adam mentioned our director of photography who's very strong on the rationalist side of 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 the debate um will not at least agree with me i don't want to debate someone who's not in the room but will not agree with me in that the scientific mindset was an invention was a a philosophy that became dominant way before it showed promise you know if you go back to the words of descartes descartes kind of invents the scientific method in his own head without actually creating any technology that improves people's lives it was a philosophy or for him to understand the world as a mathematical construct which ironically enough he had the idea he came to him in a mystical, um, talking about revelation in modernity, perhaps is something that you've written on. Um, but he, he came up with it at, so, at some point. And uh, that opened, you know, in, in the book, it's very interesting that he expands on that uh, short book, an essay essentially called Discourse and Method. Descartes um, describes the human heart as an engine, as a diesel internal combustion engine. And, and the reason, I guess, is doing that is because this is where he believes and people, his contemporaries believed, the heart was where the soul emanated from. So if he can go there and show that it's a, a machine, then the whole being who's being animated is also a machine. And I would say that from there, 
to the transhumanist agenda of today, there's a very small difference. And there's a writer called uh, Donna Haraway, um, a feminist transhumanist of the 70s, um, who said that we are already cyborgs because essentially the way we speak about our bodies is is almost like a machine and when we go to the gym and we isolate muscles and we make them grow and we talk about hormones and hydraulic systems and we're essentially treating ourselves as a machine but i think that this began as a thought as a philosophy it was never proven and it's not provable either it's a philosophy that we've adopted and has become dominant that once adopted, cannot but lead to the transhumanist agenda. Hmm. Yes, I um, find this to be very, um, well, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with what you've said about, um, about this uh, kind of lineage, right, that we find um, for um, transhumanism. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's also very odd to, to think that, you know, when you go to the gym, you're turning yourself into a, a machine because I, I, you, like it leaves out the whole sort of mental experience of going to the gym, doesn't it? I mean, you know, you feel very different. And also the fact that you feel pain, right, when you work out. Mm. <laughs> you know, it, it seems to really be a kind of uh, very narrow uh, way of, of thinking about the world. But I think also another element that might be uh, uh, productive in, in, you know, for making sense of this issue is, is um, the phenomenon of Gnosticism, mm. right? That um, like the the great uh, um, political philosopher Eric Vergelin, you know, thought that Gnosticism had a you know was a kind of this current within European culture that would periodically emerge, and, off, and, and most recently in the form you know in, in such forms as um, you know, totalitarian political ideologies. But Gnosticism uh, has to do with a kind of feeling that, you know, that uh, the cos there's something basically wrong with the cosmos, right? And, and so, um, you know, the world that we live in was created by an inferior god. A demiurge. Yes. And, and, so, and so there's this kind of, so this kind of feeling has a very long and, and um, powerful history, right? That we are not um, at ease fundamentally, you know, in our bodies or, you know, in the world. Yes, but um, this mechanical side to it is relatively recent, and I would argue that it started in the minds of a handful of philosophers in the 17th century. Yeah, although, um, although I'm, I'm thinking that, like, um, let's see, I, I can't really exactly remember the reference, but I think that the, the Gnostics often will have described the body in mechanical terms. That would be an interesting. I'm I'm not aware of that. Yeah, but that would be interesting. Yeah, the body is a kind of mechanism, mm. and that is what. Um, and so the flesh is also kind of a mechanism, right? It's it's um, it's it's animated by something which isn't created. So whatever is created is kind of like a machine, and uh, whatever is pure or redeeming about us ha is that spark that is not created. Mm. So, mm. so our bodies exist as a kind of a prison, you know, for this uncreated spark. But, but that is a little counter to how most people consider it today, because a lot of people have adopted this very mechanistic view of life, whereby there is no spirit and there is no divine spark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean that, uh, you know, like it's a kind of a, Fergerling would say that it's a kind of a Gnosticism that is disconnected from all its it's a kind of a reverse Gnosticism, you know, sure. whereas Gnosticism before tried to develop spiritual techniques to get us in touch with that uncreated spirit. Now people only see the material world, mm. the physical world. Yeah, and just for people listening, I mean, Gnosticism, the idea there um, is a trend. Some people call it a religion. It, it was mostly a current or a tendency, I'd say, whereby um, the world was seen as a, an evil creation the creation of like you just said of an inferior god not the god the real god and uh, they would take the gnostics in various places and they rose in the late hellenistic and then again in the late roman times so it, in times of relative decadence this current of gnosticism came out and the idea gnostic comes from the greek 
gnosis, gnosis, which means knowledge, and the knowledge that they suggested was mystical knowledge. So the idea is that there's absolutely nothing in this material plane that can save you. You can learn about how it works, but you're actually learning the workings of an evil machine. It's it's like learning what the matrix is made of while being stuck in the matrix. It's of little mm -hmm. use. Then, according to the Gnostics, the only way to get saved is through some kind of intervention. But now we seem, like you said, it's a reverse. It's all about staying in the material plane, optimizing the material plane, optimizing our bodies, learning how they work as a machine, right? Um, so it's not exactly Gnosticism in that respect, although there are connections, I think. Yes, I, I mean, I think there's a really wonderful novel um, that really uh, ties together a lot of the um, ideas that we have been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether uh, 1984, Brave New World, the Mad Max even, you know, the, um, the theme of, um, of the collapse of civilization. And that is um, The Possibility of an Island by Michelle Huelbeck. I don't know if you have read it, but I think no. of all the sort of novels that I've read in, in recent years, it, it's the one that I think manages to capture um, all the uh, bizarre contradictions of our time. Mm. And so the central theme of the novel is, or the central question of the novel is, if you think that your life is a waste of time and, um, and human existence is a mistake, why would you still want to live forever? Yes, there is a contradiction. <laughs> yeah. But that seems to me also to describe a lot what um, the sort of the problems, uh, the mental uh, um, problems and, you know, conflicts that many people, especially educated people, seem to have in our world. Right? They seem to think that human life is worthless, and yet they want to protect the systems that govern human life, you know, at, you know, with a kind of yeah. strong moral conviction. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's ironic now talking about uh, you know the pandemic and 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 everything. It's strange how in the time of relative nihilism, we are so adamant to preserve a life, a life that we cannot find an objective meaning for. Yes. Strange, you'd say. Yeah, it's. Uh... Has there been, are there any parallels in history? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> well, I think Gnosticism is a good one. We're definitely going to do a show um, about it because it's something that I'm very interested uh, in. Um, but just to finish up with kind of how we started with Kafka, uh, I need to mention one of my favorite and very short stories ever called The Silence of the Sirens. And it's worth mentioning also because we're so interested in ancient Greece and the silence of the sirens, very short story, um, talks about Odysseus and his journey. And what Kafka says is this. He says, when Odysseus uh, passed through the island of the sirens, so the sirens were these mythical creatures, half women from the waist up, there were beautiful women from the waist down, there were terrible monsters, and they would sing in a, a, a otherworldly uh, melody that would lure all sailors passing by. No one could resist um, the sound of the sirens, the sirens call, as they say. So they would see these beautiful women and hear the song and they would jump out of the ship and swim to this island. And once they arrived there, obviously, the sirens were monsters from the waist down and they would tear the sailors apart. And many, many parallels can be drawn and have been drawn. Um, and in the story told by Homer, the ancient Greek version, Odysseus, uh, in a very Greek twist, wants it both ways he wants to both hear the siren the the siren's song and come out of it alive and the solution that he finds because odysseus is the man of many ways uh polymichanos in in greek is the inventor and he invents a way to do this which is he ties himself on the mast of his ship and commands his sailors not to release him regardless of how much he screams and how much he he um, he obeys, he commands them to do so. 
and he puts wax in his sailor's ears so they don't hear the song and they don't get seduced. So he, tied in his mast, is the only man in history who listened to the siren's song and in terrible agony because he really wanted to break the ropes and jump in the ship and jump in the sea, but he couldn't because the sailors, the more that he would shout, the more they would squeeze the rope. And then he came out alive having heard the silence, the siren's song was the Homeric version. But in Kafka, what Kafka says is that El Odysseus thought that a little bit of wax and some ropes could protect him from the sirens. But the sirens, being mythical creatures, had, he said, had a, an even deadlier weapon than their song, which was their silence. And as Odysseus passed in front of their island, for reasons unknown, Kafka says, the, si the sirens decided to give him not their song, but their silence. And so the silence, rather than the song, was their powerful weapon, and it could destroy anyone that not singing, that not enchanting, not being in an enchanting world was the deadliest of all weapons. And Odysseus, being that man of many ways, this Polymichanos, this inventor, Kafka says that he came up with another trick to pretend that he was listening, to pretend that he was not listening to the song rather than listening to the silence. So he pretended, Odysseus pretended, that the sirens were singing, but he could not listen because he was so clever and had devised this trick with p putting a bit of wax in his ears. And, and, and he, was, he convinced himself that he was succeeding in not listening, but in reality there was no song. And if he, if he listened to that silence, he would have been destroyed, but he didn't. He pretended that he could not listen to their song. It's a bit of a mind riddle, but hopefully it makes sense. What, as an end note, uh, Professor Paik, what do you make of this? Yeah, wow, it's a very, uh, um, very, very complicated and paradoxical story, something that I've you know, uh, when I uh, was an undergraduate, I remember racking my brains over um, what Kafka was trying to say here. Um, and and revisiting it now, I'm really quite struck by, um, in some sense, the desire to, to reveal something that is at work, right? That um, the initial motive is to hear the song and to survive. But also the sirens, it seems, have their own desire, right? And, and this is what Kafka you know, very ingeniously gives us, is what does that thing which um, would destroy us want? Is it possible that they want something else sometimes than our destruction? Mm. Right? Um, and uh, in, and so, the, so the story says that, that um, you know, they... Um, they no longer had any desire to allure, right, to charm Ulysses, right, and that all they wanted to see was, um, all, they, all they wanted was to hold on as long as they could the radiance that fell from Ulysses's great eyes. Mm. You know, to see the expression of someone, right, that, that, that somehow this seems to be more, that's the secret, I think, of, of Ulysses, you know, that they were able to see. His so, look. You, yes, so Ulysses was not able to divine the secret of the song, but the sirens were able to pierce through and gain perhaps the secret of the deepest desire within Ulysses and mm. to actually see it. Well, because on one reading it seems that it's about a disenchanted world. Uh, but I guess now that you've given this other dimension, it seems a little shallow. Uh, the first time, I guess, I thought it was about living in a, yeah, in a world where the sirens no longer sing, when the gods no longer appear. But m they, in turn, are enchanted, is what you suggest, with man. Yes, it's a two-way street. 
so the so so the gods and the angels and the demons can be actually seduced by man yes and certainly by an extraordinary man like like ulysses like ulysses and perhaps that would be an, a way to, of drawing them back into existence rather than praying to them seducing them <laughs> which is a yes. thought i've never thought before but it's very interesting yes seducing the gods back into existence yes uh, it's um actually that's the title of one of my favorite books by baudrillard seduction seduction yes well i'm sure we have much much more to talk about and um, i would like to thank you very much for this discussion it's been our pleasure it's having pleasure. you and oh, thank you very much. I'm sure we're going to have more more of these discussions. Um, so we're going to uh, bid you adieu for, for the moment. Uh, wish you well. Uh, I guess it's getting a little late where you are. And uh, we'll keep in touch and we will speak again very soon. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Michael and Adam. And uh, have, a, have a wonderful day. Take care, you too.